Let me get started by summarizing where we stand. We said that we are going to um, solve for the, for the perturbations produced by a single K mode. And that when we look at the sky in a given direction n in the Newtonian gauge, what we are going to see is just um, so imagine we are looking at a point A at a distance d from us, given by the redshift uh, that you can calculate using when recombination happened, the temperature that you would observe in that direction is a, a combination of the intrinsic temperature at the location A, a Doppler shift, a gravitational redshift uh, factor, and there's also ISW effects, which I will not discuss very much in these lectures, that have to do with if there is a time-dependent gravitational potential along the line of sight, photons get redshifted or blue shifted, and that can add to the anisotropies. This is an effect that is only important on large angular scales, and uh, I will not talk much about it. So um, the other thing that we discussed was the fact that, so that's uh, point number one. Point number two is that this, uh, this um, delta gamma, which is the density perturbations in the fluid of the photons and uh, the velocities and so on, are basically given by something like this. So. Let me write it, let, let me write it. So uh, we are considering one single K mode, so the spatial dependence is given by e to the ikx. And then there is some time dependence, which I spent some time uh, discussing, uh, that it was pretty much fixed by the fact that the perturbation started outside the horizon. So all of these quantities um, have the same form, and this is, uh, those that you can solve for, the ones that are doing uh, the problem one that I gave, you will be solving for this, and I wrote the equations and discussed them last time. So just, uh, so these things are what you solve using, uh, get using the equations that I told you are usually called transfer functions. This is just the time, the spatial dependence from the fact that I'm considering one single Fourier mode. And this is the, uh, 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 the Gaussian random initial conditions computed from inflation. In particular, if it's just a Gaussian random field, this zeta k at the initial um, is just the delta function of k plus k prime times the power spectrum of this variable zeta of k, which goes roughly, this is a constant divided by k cubed and perhaps some um, small uh, tilt. So you start with those initial conditions, a Gaussian random field. That, the, those uh, zetas are just complex numbers. Uh, distributed in a Gaussian fashion, uh, that the face of those things are not fixed, but last time I discussed the fact that the time-dependent piece, uh, the face of that is uh, fixed by the fact that uh, things uh, started outside the horizon. In particular, let me just make a simple plot as a function of time a, let, uh, a or time, the scale factor a, uh, we can consider the, so this is a commoving, commoving size of something. So if we have a given K mode, the K mode has a fixed size, the wavelength of things, and we are, I'm going to just compare this with the horizon during the radiation era. The horizon in commoving coordinates, one over HA is growing, then comes the matter era, it starts growing a different, with a different power. Um, so here is proportional to a, here is proportional to the square root of a. Um, so what I meant was that when we solve for the time evolution of these functions, if we, as long as we start at sufficiently early times such that the, 
uh, we put the initial conditions such as a, at a sufficiently early time, then when I follow the time evolution of a given K mode, I start when the K mode is on scales much, much larger than the horizon. The solutions to those equations have a growing and decaying mode. So by the time the mode, uh, by the time you get to horizon crossing, that, let me call this horizon crossing, here the mode is outside of the horizon. Here is inside of the horizon. The time dependence of, the, of delta gamma and V gamma inside the horizon make it such that the solutions are just so, sines and cosines, just simple oscillatory waves, okay? So if I follow the, the history of a K mode, once I'm here, the solutions are sines and cosines with whatever phase you want, it's just fine. But, once you're, but when you're here, the solutions are growing and decaying modes. And so if I start here, the decaying mode will go away and the, fix, the phase of the oscillation that will result of the time evolution of these initial conditions here is fixed. Of the two solutions, you only pick one by the fact that you live outside the horizon for a while, okay? And uh, as long as you do this uh, sufficiently early, uh, for all practical purposes um, of observations, you will, the decaying mode will have gone away and you will be fixed, you will be left with a phase, a fixed phase, and by that I mean the phase of the time dependence of these quantities, okay? Is this clear? Inflation, what it does is extend this diagram to some past in which the horizon is decreasing with time, the mode is inside the horizon here, freezes for a long time, even during inflation. There is a decaying mode and a constant mode. Zeta remains constant. You get here a perfect, uh, with a perfect phase as well. It's not needed for the purpose of the observation. If we were to just start here, it would be good enough. I mean, it doesn't, this is our way of producing the a, a, a reasonable way of producing these initial conditions, but if somebody were to produce initial conditions, say, at, even at Big Bang nucleosynthesis, it will probably be fine for the observations, okay? Is this clear or not? So we, what I, we have very then very good evidence that it is indeed the case that perturbation started at the very beginning as initial conditions when the modes were outside the horizon. That's what we will, I will claim we have very good evidence for, okay? Any questions? No? So then what we said is that, um, say, for example, if I plotted delta gamma as a function of time, okay, there will be the special time of recombination, the uh, scale factor of which is just set by the physics of when uh, recombination, when uh, hydrogen atom, you know, the physics of the hydrogen atom. This, uh, then you start with some initial conditions. In Basically, the decaying mode goes away. So here for a given mode, say, is the time of horizon crossing of this mode. So, well, let me just plot like this. So it'll be some oscillation. The mode will be constant much before, say, say, here is the horizon crossing time of that mode. So say, for example, something like this, okay? And it makes some oscillations and you catch it at recombination. You can think of, we are taking the picture of the time evolution of that thing at a fixed time of recombination. Now you consider a smaller wavelength perturbation, it will start uh, outside the horizon. If the, if, the, um, if the spectrum is scale invariant, it will start with the same amplitude. It has a higher wavelength, so it crosses the horizon first, and it oscillates more times. And you, well, I just, you know, this one I, I catch here, or something like that, okay? So uh, higher frequencies have more oscillations, you catch them at a different point in their phase of these oscillations. Phase are fixed because of the evolution outside the horizon, okay? The velocity is the time derivatives of this. Uh, roughly speaking, the velocity is proportional from the continuity equation to this, okay? So rather than starting as a constant, it starts at zero and, okay? Um, so for example, if I now look at the if I now look at the formula, so now, so now what we are going to do, we said is that if I want to know um, the, what I would observe in my entire sky, what I would need to do is make, take uh, the map that I obtained by combining 
the density and velocity and potential of every single Fourier mode in, and summing them all up, it's a linear problem, okay? So, um, if you want, and what, what is usually done is to take the sky as, uh, and expand it into spherical harmonics. So, for example, let's take just the piece. So delta T appears to have two pieces, uh, one which is proportional to n, to n, the part with the velocity, and the other one that it doesn't depend on n directly. It depends on n only through the fact that as I move the direction of observation, I change the location of the point A, okay? So, so let me just, uh, for simplicity here, just take, I mean, you have, to, you, can take, you have to take both, but let me just, for doing something here, let, let me just take the part that looks like this, okay, of phi. So this, and, and uh, when, we, when we compute this uh, power spectrum CL, what, what the power spectrum is, is you expand this map on the sky into spherical harmonics, okay, YLM star of N times the, the map that you observe, okay? You expand it into spherical harmonics and then you compute the sum over M of ALM, ALM star, the expectation value of this, where expectation value is now taking over this random variable zeta, okay? So you imagine a lot of initial conditions uh, determined by, by these values of zeta, in each of the, for given initial conditions, you have, we have more or less computed the map of the sky that will be observed. Then you compute the ALMs for that particular map. You square them, take the expectation value, and this is the CLs, okay? Is this clear? So the definition of what those, uh, and, and, and the reason for taking a, uh, expectation value of a square of the temperature map is that if we are thinking that all that there is to it is a Gaussian random field, the variance of the random field, the Gaussian random field is determining in everything, okay? ALM is just a linear superposition of, uh, so if you want, I can do this. Integral d cube k of, the, of, the, of this formula, delta gamma over four plus phi plus the velocity term produced by each k mode, which is just given by the amplitude. So that formula here, okay? You plug this into here, and you, and you see the ALM produced by each k mode. So if you want, you could think of this Without the, if I put the d cube k on the other side, this would be the ALM produced by each single Fourier mode, and then I'm adding them all up, okay? If it's a Gaussian random field, the variance of the ALMs is all there is to it as well, and the temperature will be a Gaussian random field if phi and delta and so on are Gaussian random fields because it's just a linear superposition of Gaussian random fields, okay? Yeah? D, o, D, D omega, D, D square n, the, the angle. Okay, so I have the map as a function of angle. I multiply, I'm doing the Fourier transform, but because it's on the sky, I have to do it with spherical harmonics, okay? If, I, if you're considering a small patch of the sky, the sky is pretty much flat and you can do actual Fourier transforms. Uh, but if you're uh, doing a W map, you will end up doing something like this, okay? Um, and so all we need to do All we need to do is, for example, plug in the parts here of, uh, so ALM then becomes what? The integral d cube k. What is the, the, the dependence on the angle of delta gamma over four plus phi? The only dependence on the angle comes from the fact that this x position, x location, is pretty much proportional to the distance times the direction of observation, okay? So as I change the direction of observation, what's making things depend on the direction of observation is e to the ikx. That's the only factor that depends on n. Well, in the case of the velocity, there's also v dot n, so there's that explicit n, okay? So that's why I'm keeping, I'm just doing uh, the one with, uh, that doesn't have this N in front so that I can easily, more easily for today do the, but it's just the same, it's the same story. 
uh, do the, the integral, okay? So now, zeta k initial does not depend on, on the angle. The delta gamma tilde of k and tau of recombination plus phi tilde does not depend on angle. And this thing, d square n, e to the i k dot x, where x then was n times the distance to the last scattering surface, okay? And this integral is a Bessel function, JL of KD, okay? Apart from some minor, depends on your convention, but some I to the L stuff that doesn't matter. Um, okay? So now, the ALM produced in a given sky will be a random variable depending on the zetas that, you know, the random realization of the zetas sum over the ALM, if you want, seen by each of the, of the, produced by each of the Ks. And then, if you want to compute ALM, ALM star expectation value, I don't know if I put the star, yes? That's CL. Um, then you multiply two of these, take expectation value. This is proportional to the power spectrum times the delta function of k and k prime. So each of them has an integral over k, but because of the delta function collapses to just one integral. And so this thing is then d cube k, power spectrum of the initial conditions, okay? The square, let me call this, uh, I don't know, delta t effective, you know, is the combination of these things, uh, delta t effective tilde squared, okay? Bessel function of KD squared, okay? So that's the formula for, uh, for the CLs, for those curves that we've been looking at. And you can see it depends on the initial conditions, but these are scale invariant, okay? So all the structures of the peaks and all of these things that break the scale invariance is coming from this which is a function then of the k. Just a sec. This, on the other hand, is just, uh, you can plot them and you will realize that all they do is that when you're talking about a specific L, it, this is a, it's, it's a window that peaks when, when you're considering in this integral a k of the order of L over d. So one simple way to think about this is that when you're looking at a given L, you're just basically measuring this wave number k, okay? And so the CLs is basically, so once you go through that exercise, which I leave you more or less as an exercise, if you were able to, in this integral, take this out, take this out, because this picks up this specific, L, this specific k for a given L, you discover that L square CL is approximately the value of this transfer function at k given by L over d, and uh, the power spectrum of the initial conditions at k, uh, k cubed, sorry, I'm missing k cubed, times the power spectrum of the initial conditions also evaluated at um, k of order L over d. So this is the rough, uh, and you can see that if this did not have any, if, if this did not have any scales on it, okay, the scale invariant spectrum of zeta such that k cubed p of zeta is constant leads to a scale invariant spectrum in L, which is as L square CL equals to constant, okay? And this L square comes from the integral of the, of the Bessel function square over all of k. So, I mean, this I leave you as uh, kind of an exercise to do. Yes, there was a question. Sorry, uh, thank you. Um, this was f f for the sum over m, one over two L plus one. Okay. This thing is not, this is correct. Uh, YLM is missing here. Yeah. Um, where? The YLM is missing there. No, no, um, yeah, here there will be just the YLM. And, and a star, and if you actually do this integral, you get YLM of k hat, of the direction of k, when you actually do this integral. 
But then when you sum over all m's and divide by 2l plus 1, this factor goes away, and then you end, are left with this, OK? Um, so um, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, just some simple algebra that I suggest that you do. Imagine that you are giving. Uh, a temperature like that, all the x dependence comes from this, all the angle dependence comes from that. You then calculate the ALMs by integrating with the spherical harmonics, square them, take the expectation value, you will get this. And if you take this out of the integral, assuming, so assuming kq p of k is constant and you can take it out of the integral, assuming this varies very slowly, take it outside of the integral, then you end up with the integral dk over k of the Bessel function, and you will get then uh, L, L, 1 over L, L plus 1, actually, or something, which is this L squared. I'm assuming L is bigger than 1. For the OK? So the conclusion is that when we look at, the, at, this power, as, at, the, at these plots of CLs, what we are looking at is the initial power spectrum, which what might be a con you know, if it's perfectly scale invariant, this is just a constant. And all the modulation that we see is coming from the, these transfer functions that we calculated yesterday, or we, I told you how to calculate yesterday. Um, and now um, we can see a few things. So, so let's take that to be our, so that is the, um, the rough uh, procedure, okay? And now you can see what happens, or just let's make sure we understand what happens. These facts, this fact that uh, the phase here is fixed means that if I follow in time a particular k, there are certain k's for which this solution, which we said was, Roughly speaking, delta gamma may be cosine of k times the epoch of recombination times the sound speed, something like that. So now if I say that this delta gamma over 4, let's say that the delta gamma over 4 plus phi was something like this, OK? The square of that appears here, OK? And, and so you, you should see the structure of peaks as I move L. L is just given, sorry, K is just given by L over D. This is just the projection, the typical angle between maxima and minima in that thing that scales with D, OK? As you move L, you're moving K. And so this should have a structure of peaks like cosine square, OK, of, uh, of L. And so that's roughly, you know, this structure that, that you see. At this level, it should just have been cosine square, OK? Is it clear as to why this leads to this? Yeah? So let's, um, let's be slightly more careful as to, um, as to the form of this. So the, the two things are... Uh, are uh, before I, I am more careful, let me just um, say the things that we already know. The things that we already know is that the physics of these acoustic oscillations only depend on the densities at the time, okay? So the locations of these peaks, their heights, and so on, they're all determined by this transfer function, which only depends on omega matter h square, omega b h square, these type of parameters, okay? In addition to this, I observe these peaks at a particular L value, a particular angle. In order to do the mapping between physical scale and angle, I need the distance to the last scattering surface. And there is where the omega lambda kind of dependence will come in. As I make the distance to the last scattering larger, the angle still becomes smaller. If it brings it here, the angle for the same, the same physical scale, the same, imagine you keep the, d the density is the same, omega matter and h square, you keep it the same. The shape of these peaks, the physics of the acoustic oscillations and the damping and all of the things that we're going to discuss will be fixed, but you might see it at a different angle by changing the distance. 
And this is what happens if you make the universe curved, open, or closed. The geodesics of photons, you know, get, get in an open universe, separate more at a fixed distance for, at a, for, for a given angle. And so you would move the location of the peak in this to different angles as you make the universe curved, flat, or, or, or curved. And that is the, the, the reason why when those boomerang results that, uh, came out, the, the ones that we saw this morning in the talk, everybody was convinced that the universe was flat because with rough uh, uh, understanding of, uh, of, of what's omega matter and omega variance and so on, you could predict where the peak was. And as you, as you change the distance, it changed in angle by a lot, and it was nailed to be pretty much a flat universe. OK? So let me, let me uh, for the purpose of discussing, uh, for the purpose of discussing uh, parameter dependencies, let me um, be slightly more specific about one, one thing more, which is the fact that I've, I've, I've written here um, um, cosine or sine for the velocity. That's not quite right. The actual solution is more of the form a constant times cosine, the same cosine that I just wrote, minus another constant, OK? So these are oscillations that are not around 0, but around another a, a, a shifted uh, location, OK? And why is that? It's very easy. So um, imagine, so w w where is this coming from? It's coming from the effect of gravity, because what this is, what, what's happening is that there are acoustic oscillations in potential wells. There's gravitational potential. So if, if, you just, uh, if you just have gas and there's a gravitational potential well, there is an equilibrium position in which the gas inside the gravitational potential well is slightly more compressed, OK? And if you perturb around the solution, you will oscillate around the location of hydrostatic equilibrium, OK? Not around 0, but around the location of hydrostatic equilibrium. So as you change, basically what happens is that as you change the baryon density in this gas, you make this, uh, the photon baryon fluid more heavy, and it sinks into the gravitational potential. So the location of the, of the, um, of the hydrostatic equilibrium point changes. OK? So when you solve those equations, you will see that uh, if, if you were to calculate this for the photon baryon fluid in the limit in which the mass from the baryons, from the protons, is negligible, then it will indeed oscillate around 0. But as you start cranking up omega baryon h square, rather than oscillating around 0, this combination starts oscillating around a different value. And so what will happen when then if you start oscillating around if now, rather than 0 being this, 0 is that, when I square it, I will end up with a structure of peaks in which the odd and even peaks do not have the same height, OK? So, the act, so, so then point number one, I oscillate around the hydrostatic equilibrium. And the, and the position of this depends on how, how heavy this gas is, uh, basically on the amount of baryons in this gas, so omega bh square. And this leads then to differences in the heights of odd and even peaks. So my handwriting is probably totally impossible to read, but that's what I, um, OK? So that's, uh, that's parameter dependency number one. So uh, another parameter dependency that uh, uh, you discover is the fact that, um, that when you are, cons as, as I said in the first lecture, matter radiation equality happens at a very, very close to recombination, OK? So as you look at the different modes that are accessible to us in the CMB, they correspond to modes, some of which are enter the horizon in the radiation era, some of which enter the horizon in the matter era, OK? And when you, you know, you, you, you can play with uh, the equations in problem one to figure this out. Uh, what happens is that um, for the same amplitude of the zeta fluctuations, fix that, fix this amplitude you will see that the size of the temperature fluctuations that you observe in the sky are different for modes that enter the horizon in the matter era and in the radiation era. 
in the matter area, there will be a cancellation between the gravitational potential part and the other part and, the, and this density part that makes this suppressed in some sense. And in fact, I think one of your problems is to calculate this in the zeta gauge, uh, the Sachs-Wolf effect in the zeta gauge. So the Sachs-Wolf effect corresponds to the temperature fluctuations on modes that are very large compared to the Hubble horizon, so that entered well inside of, of the matter era, much la sorry, modes that are very large compared to the horizon at recombination. So they entered well inside of the matter era, and you will discover that the formula for the temperature fluctuations is something like zeta divided by five, okay? So there's, in some sense, a big cancellation for what you, for a fixed value of zeta, what is the temperature that you would observe for very low case, the ones that enter the horizon in the matter era? Long story short, but in this set of peaks, somewhere around here in the first, uh, somewhere around the first peak, somewhere around here, uh, you go from modes that enter the horizon during the matter era to go modes that enter the horizon during the radiation era, okay? And th then the relative amplitude of these peaks in some sense is larger here than there, so we can determine where this transition between the radiation era and the matter era occurred by looking at the typical size of these peaks. This is why the first peak is so much, it looks so much bigger than the Sachs-Wolf plateau in the CL curve, is this effect. So if you look at the CLs, it looks like this was supposed to be a cosine square when I started, so this should have been the same as that, but it's not, and it's because of this, okay? So we can determine wh what scale corresponds to the matter radiation equality. So that tells us that we can, by looking at where that is compared to the position of the peaks, we know where omega matter h square is, which is what determines matter radiation equality. And by looking at the, um, at the relative sizes of the odd and even peaks, we can determine omega b h square, okay? So this is uh, the... Um, and then the, the rest, uh, and then we can determine the distance to the last scattering surface by, by, by uh, seeing at what angle we see this, okay? And uh, um, yeah, so, so in the distance to the last scattering surface is just given in a flat universe by the difference in conformal time between today and recombination. You can do this integral and you will discover that this is uh, uh, basically, if you want, I can write it like this. Uh, and then some function of omega lambda and omega matter. So this is the, f the value that the distance would have in a matter-dominated universe with uh, just a matter-dominated universe. And then there is a correction that depends on omega m lambda. So by determining the angle, we basically determine this. Because this omega matter h square is already known from the argument that I just gave. So this is how the parameter dependencies go. And let me just mention one more thing, OK? Which is the fact that um, these acoustic oscillations are damped. As I told you, the mean free, so we started doing all of this. Um, by assuming that the mean free path was basically zero and recombination happened instantaneously, but that's not the case. The mean free path, I did show you a plot of it, is growing. So, um, so, so fluctuations on scales much smaller than the mean free path are damped, just as you cannot propagate sound waves with frequencies or uh, wavelengths much smaller than the mean free path of in air or something. So this... Uh, these oscillations will be damped, exponentially damped, on a scale that basically has to do with the diffusion of uh, photons away, um, across this distance of a given wavelength. So if you take a, a given, so in other words, you can ask the question, since the Big Bang, how far could the, un, could the, um, could the photons diffuse out of these acoustic oscillations? And if the mean free path were constant, you would say, ah, it's a diffusion process, so the distance that the photons would have, uh, L of diffusion, that the photons would have diffused is something like the square root of the number of steps times the, the mean free path or mean free time, tau c. Let me call this the tau, tau be time between co collisions, which is nothing other than one over the number density of the electrons, the 
uh, Thomson scattering cross section, and then A because I'm doing everything in conformal time. And the number of, of, uh, of these, the square root of the number of these uh, things, this number is nothing other than the ratio between the age of the universe at the time that you're interested in, say, recombination, divided by the mean free time. So this is how many scatterings there is, the square root of the number of scatterings times, times the distance the photon can travel between the scatterings. This is more or less how much it will diffuse. So square root of the age of, of the, of the tau of recombination and, uh, and uh, mean free path. Mean free path. That, that, that would be the guess of the size of the scale. And uh, indeed, uh, it more or less, for, the, for getting the dependencies more or less work, it doesn't work quite well because the, um, all of this is time dependent, right? So it's not that it's n, n equal scatterings and so on. And you can do more sophisticated calculations for, for, for the purposes of uh, this lecture, there is a, an exponential damping of this. So there is, the peaks are not the same height because of being oscillating around hydrostatic equilibrium. The, these peaks are larger than that because this mode entered the horizon during the radiation era. But eventually, all of these peaks, everything gets damped out by, by this diffusion process, OK? And the only last thing that I wanted to say about this diffusion process is that in terms of, say, the uh, time at recombination, the age of the universe at recombination, it goes as the square root. While tau of recombination, which sets the scale and so on, just goes proportional to, to tau. So one is proportional to the, this one is proportional to the square root of the Hubble constant during recombination, while at recombination, while, say, um, the, the, the sound horizon is proportional to just one over the Hubble constant, okay? And this I mentioned because this is, so you can see that I've already, with the things that I told you before, the uh, odd even peaks, the location of uh, matter radiation equality, you've already determined omega matter is square and omega lambda, uh, sorry, and omega BH square. This has a, and long story short, this has a different dependency. So if you measure the, the, the damping scale, how it damps, it's an over-constrained thing. We sh we're supposed to already know this and then we go with ACT or SPT, measure the damping scale, you better match. And it did match, okay? So it's, not, it's a non-trivial uh, non consistency check of the whole thing. But if you are even, if you are very um, energetic, you'll try to make sure that everything is working and so you'll allow, you, you know, you'll allow for some parameter that, that makes this float by itself. For example, you can, you can cha change the, the, um, the number of relativistic species, the number of neutrinos, because that changes the location of matter radiation equality for a fixed omega matter H square. If there are more neutrinos, matter radiation equality happens in a different place. And so you can now, you can now fix, fit for this n effective number of effective of neutrinos by comparing this scale with what you've learned from the lower L peaks, and you discover some slight preference for more for more neutrino species, just like a two sigma thing. But, um, or for you can let float the amount of uh, helium in the universe, which also we've, I've assumed that if I tell you how much, is, how much is the total density of baryons, helium contributes to the weight, but helium recombines before of hydrogen, so it doesn't contribute electrons. So, you know, the, the dependence, there, there's some. Things change slightly if I make the composition of the universe in terms of the amount of helium change. So again, you can think of this as a consistency check of the number of degrees of uh, relativistic degrees of freedom or a consistency check on the uh, primordial abundance of helium. And the conclusion is that you definitely rule out the possibility that there are no neutrinos or that the helium, there's no helium. You constrain, so that's good, you constrain the, value, the number of neutrinos and the helium abundance, it, and within two sigma, they work uh, with what we expect, three and, uh, and whatever it is that comes out from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, 25 or 24% or whatever. Um, so, but with a small tendency of having uh, more neutrinos if you are uh, thinking about that, but that's probably... Um, and very nice papers, uh, 
I think the, the last, uh, um, the damping tail, the last paper to appear is the one from SPT, but both SPT and uh, ACT have very nice papers on this, and you can look, think about this consistency check and see how everything has come together. Any questions about this? No? Yeah? Um, in the, in, 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 so I've, I've, uh, in the way I've defined it, the Gaussian random variable, I've put it here, and this A and B are just some constants that come from solving the equations, and I'm just writing this down, okay? So, but... No, no, there definitely is a symmetry between, uh, but you will see that um, that this enters uh, enters squared. Okay, so so there's definitely a symmetry. I'm not claiming that. Uh, yeah, this is something that you know. Just try to sit down at some point and work for it because it's important. You know, it's it's. Uh, Maybe a little bit confusing, uh, but it's the basis of, of for, for, or one of the basis for which we claim that inflation is this, or sorry, perturbations from the very beginning are the only solution, okay? So I'm not claiming that these things are all positive. These are Gaussian random variables, and so they can be positive or negative. All I'm claiming is that the face of this or the actual solution for the time dependent part is fixed and it's independent of the direction of k. All the randomness is, is here, and it's absorbed in the CLs in this P of K when I take the expectation value, okay? So the easiest way to think how you will get scales is the following. All of the modes are in, in phase. So imagine taking a specific K for which this thing vanishes, okay? Because K tau is 2 pi or whatever it needs to be. So no matter what is your Gaussian random variable, on the sky, there, on, for, for that particular wavelength, there's zero fluctuations, nothing. You can start with whatever you want as your Gaussian random variable. If that is the only k it existed in the universe, you look out, uniform sky, okay? So that is this, so, and that's a, so, so you can see that if this vanishes, it doesn't matter. So, so clearly, the fact that there are places where this vanishes for every single k, okay, has very, you know, striking, um, striking uh, uh, consequences, that if all that there was to it was this term, there would be specific L modes for which there would be zero fluctuations. Even though I started with a scale invariant power spectrum of fluctuations uh, for this thing, okay? So the fact that they're all in phase have this, and, and, and is reflected in, in these uh, wiggles like that. Let me then point out one thing. Why, does the CL, why don't the CLs uh, don't have them plotted but the CLs do not go to zero. They, they uh, are something like that, okay? There's the damping. Why this doesn't go to zero? It's because uh, on top of the cos, this one is, if you want, the one that I calculated is the cosine squared, and it would go to zero, but the velocity was the time derivative of, of this one, so it, it's like something like a sine squared contribution that fills in here. So when this is in a maximum, the other one is in a zero, and so on. So it doesn't go to zero because I should have also added to, you know, same formula here, but with a, with a plus the velocity term that because of that n would have given me here the time derivative or the, the derivative of the Bessel function, okay? Um, any other question? Okay. So let me, let me uh, make, so let me make one uh, then comment. So what we have computed then, what we have predicted is the expectation value of ALMs, okay? So each of these ALMs then, let me go to here then, uh, let's see where do I go, is a Gaussian random variable, and we have predicted ALM squared, which is nothing other than the width of this Gaussian distribution. So if I take ALMs for a fixed L, uh, they should be a Gaussian distribution, and we've just calculating the CLs, which is the variance of that, okay? That's what we have calculated. So 
because we are starting with random initial condition, we end up with random skies, and we, what we can calculate is the width of this probability distribution, which we, what we have determined is that the width of this probability distribution oscillates with L, okay? The one, so now when we go and measure parameters, as, as you heard this morning, what we try to do is measure those CLs as best we can in our sky and compare to the result of this calculation. Okay, but the, and and uh, Bill spent some time telling you about the different detectors and, and 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 how things have gotten much better and so on. The only thing that I want to point out is that there, even if you were to measure the um, the sky with a perfect uh, detector, okay, you would still, for example, for an, for for each L, you only have two L plus one ALMs that you could possibly measure if you measure the entire sky. Okay, so given the sky that we have observed, we cannot determine this variance of this distribution, which is the, what CL is with perfect accuracy, because we only have two L plus one samples at most, because we don't even get to measure the entire sky, for each L, okay? So there are some irreducible, um, some irreducible level of uncertainty, which is usually called cosmic variance, which is nothing other than the statement that with the finite number of L's that we can measure, because I'm only making a statistical prediction saying that if I start with some random initial conditions, the CLs will, will have this as an average with this structure and so on, but I cannot predict my sky. I cannot say I should see hot spot there, cold spot there, and so on. I can only uh, make predictions for the variance of this distribution under the assumption that I started with a Gaussian distribution as well. This one is a Gaussian distribution, and the variance are related by this thing and so on. So there's, an irreducible, uh, there's an irreducible level of uncertainty called the, which we usually call the cosmic variance. It's there, and of course we include this when we, when we, um, when we um, fit for parameters, we, we cannot demand that even if we had a, it's not just the detector noise uh, or any other systematic that we have, but we cannot demand a perfect agreement between the CL curve that we actually measure and this average that we predict because we only measure a finite number of samples, okay? So in some sense, for all of these parameters, there's an irreducible uh, measure, at least in this way, there is an irreducible uh, error bar, okay? Any, any questions? No? Yeah? Which final expression? If it, oh, just because I forgot the square. Thank you. It just enters square because I'm computing two ALMs, each of which has a transfer function, so it comes square. Okay, so that's it. Okay? Sounds good? So let me then um, talk a little bit about uh, large scale structure before. Um, be, because I want to make a few points. So we've calculated um, what, the, what the temperature and isotropy should look like, but in the, in the process of doing that, you're also solving, especially those doing the problems, you're also solving for the gravitational potential and the dark matter fluctuations. I haven't talked about them very much because uh, I was interested in getting to these CLs, but it's part of uh, the story. And it's important mainly because we are observing things in the matter era, and so the, the source of the gravitational potential is basically the matter fluctuations. And so if the, the gravitational potential that enters here and enters there is very much related to what the dark matter is doing, okay? So we can trace the, um, the, the distribution of matter using, for example, galaxy surveys, as you heard from David. Um, so I just want to make a, f a few points uh, re related to that, um, given that we already have uh, the, the equations, okay? So, um, 
So just as we can combine uh, the equations for the photon baryon fluid to get a second order differential equation, same thing happens for, for the dark matter. Let me just write it down. It's just the conservation of Timu Nu. So this here now, I, I'm going, and I'm going to be interested in, the, in what happens pretty much inside the horizon, okay? So let me just use, these dots are going to be regular time, not conformal time. And uh, so you get something like that. And so this comes from taking the, the, the equation for the velocity, taking a divergence for it. The force on the dark matter it has to do with the gradient of the gravitational potential. So in this, in this equation, it sh we should get a term proportional to the Laplacian of the gravitational potential, which is nothing other than I'm all inside the horizon for the purposes of this. And assuming all there is is the dark matter, okay? So let me just, uh, so a good approximation in the, in the matter area, okay? This is just from Poisson equation, Laplacian of phi is four pi g rho delta, okay? So let me just tell you, you solve this equation during the matter era, so during the matter era, okay? You solve this equation, so uh, delta will be t to some power, okay? Um, and you discover that the two solutions are that delta goes as t to the two-thirds, or equivalently, delta goes as a of t. Uh, this is the growing mode, and then there is a decaying mode, which is proportional to 1 over t. Th these are the two solutions for how the density scales with time. And as David already mentioned, um, the, this is just the growth of structure during the matter era. One point that I want to make now that I'm here, imagine the following situation. Uh, imagine the situation in which you have this dark matter, but in addition, in addition to this dark matter, you have some other relativistic part, non-relativistic particle that does not cluster on the scales that you're interested in. So this is all valid um, for modes as a function of k. Note that. Uh, it's independent of K. Every K mode grows in the exact same way um, because there's just no scale here in the problem. Um, so, but imagine that you had a situation in which you had some non-relativistic form of matter which contributed to the, to the expansion of the universe but did not cluster. And this, this is the, the uh, uh, perfect example of this is, um, is um, neutrinos with a mass, if you have neutrin the, the, the neutrinos but they have a mass, they have become non-relativistic, but they still have pretty large velocities. Uh, and so on scales such that uh, the gravitational potential is, uh, is uh, smaller than their, so, so, so then the, their velocities is larger than the escape velocity of a given gravitational potential, they do not fall into this gravitational potential, just go. So they do not cluster, so if you want, in this, uh, here is this, this came from the Laplacian of phi, okay? But if, if there's, and this came from Laplacian of phi equal four pi g rho bar delta. So if, um, if um, imagine now you have this, uh, uh, the, only, the, only, the only, so the only species that, uh, that uh, cluster only forms part of the total, so while Hubble is given by the rho of the sum of the neutrinos and the dark matter, the rho bar here comes only for the dark, from the dark matter because the neutrinos do not, do not, uh, do not um, cluster in this example. So then what you will discover is that the growth of structure is not as fast as this one. So if here you just say, so let me just replace this by using uh, Friedman equation here, eight pi g over three times rho is h squared. So this is thing, this thing is h squared times uh, three halves, okay? This term is three halves times h squared. Now imagine that uh, you have this, uh, for this relativistic, uh, this uh, additional neutrinos, only the dark matter will contribute as a source of the gravitational potential because the neutrinos would be uniform. So this, is, if you want, is the dark matter component of the total, omega in dark matter, while this is the, while h is the total h, okay? So the damping now, this term, the friction, is larger relative to this one, 
compared to what happens in the matter era. So when you have massive neutrinos in, in this way, fluctuations will grow slower than this. If you just now, they will still grow as a power, but if you figure out the power, it will be smaller than, than uh, one for A of T as you increase omega in the neutrinos, okay? And that's how uh, we, can, uh, we can figure out if the neutrinos have a mass because they, they, uh, they make on the scales that they do not cluster. So there are some scales in which they can cluster depending on their mass, some scales in which they don't. In the scales that they don't, it's quite, the, the power is, uh, the, the size of fluctuations is suppressed because fluctuations could not have grown as fast since the matter era, okay? So that's uh, something to say. But I guess the most dramatic, uh, the most dramatic uh, situation is the following. So, um, and if you recall, um, yesterday David said that uh, in lambda CDM, um, I shouldn't have erased this. In lambda CDM, if you look at the power, uh, at the power spectrum of fluctuations in the density of dark matter, it looks like something like this. So here it goes as k, and here it goes as k to minus three, okay? And there's a peak given by matter radiation equality, okay? This is again very simple to get from our picture here. Um, and the equation that I erased. So now co consider, um, so this is the time of matter radiation equality, okay? So from here on, evolution is like in the matter era, dense uh, fluctuations grow like A, okay? But what happens, so if you want, we are now in the business of calculating the initial conditions for fluctuations at this point, okay? And since then, they grow as A. What happens is the following. If you, if you track uh, the evolution of delta for a mode that entered the horizon uh, during uh, the matter era, like this one, and compare it to a mode that entered the horizon during the radiation era, during the radiation era, similarly to what happened when in the case, what happens in the case of neutrinos, during the radiation era is even worse because the dark matter contributes negligibly to the total energy density. The gravitational potential is dominated by the photons. The photons have these oscillations that do not grow in time. Uh, the amplitude does not grow in time. And from the Poisson equation, Laplacian of phi given by four pi g rho bar times delta, if this delta is just an oscillation whose amplitude does not change in time, if this is dominated by photons, which go as one over a square, a to the fourth, there's an overall a squared here if I'm doing this in co-moving coordinates. Phi decays with time, okay? So very quickly in the, in the source of the, of the, so here we had an equation delta double dot plus two h delta dot minus, uh, um, it was this four pi g rho bar delta equals to zero, okay? The, this came from the gravitational potential, but in the radiation area, basically there's no term here. So if you solve this equation, you will discover that the growing mode is just logarithmically growing, okay? So during all this period of time, delta pretty much doesn't grow, okay? And after the equality, it can start to grow like, like A. So this lack of growth during a period of time when the mode was inside the horizon, but uh, the universe was radiation dominated, is responsible for the fact that this, curves turn, this curve turns over. If the universe had, al had always been uh, matter dominated, the power spectrum will just be, so this is zeta, so if the power spectrum of zeta is scale invariant is k to the minus three, the power spectrum of, uh, that's the gravitational potential, but because of this k squared, the power spectrum of delta goes as k to the fourth, times the power spectrum of phi or the gravitational potential or zeta. So for scale invariant initial fluctuations in a matter only universe, you would get a power spectrum of delta that goes like k. k to the fourth from the square of this and one over k cubed from the power spectrum of phi being one over k cubed, okay? So this is k to the fourth from the Laplacian squared and the p of zeta which is one over k cubed. This is the P of zeta, okay? But 
all of these modes that enter the horizon uh, during the radiation era, during some time they could not grow, and this is the reason why they, get, they are smaller than they would otherwise be, and that's the reason for this turnover, okay? So this is also determined by the epoch of matter radiation equality, okay? That, and you can easily take this equation with the things that we have already figured out and, uh, and determine this, these uh, scalings. It's not, it's, it's, it's simple enough. And, and from there follows the picture of, um, of hierarchical structure formation that David, uh, that David mentioned. And um, in addition to this, one thing that uh, I will have you look at in the problems is the fact that uh, what another nice thing that happens in this, uh, in this model is that you have, uh, before recombination, all of the baryons, all of the gas moving with the, with the, with the photons, having these acoustic oscillations. And at recombination, they are released. And they are non-relativistic together with, uh, so together with the cold dark matter, they form the total, the total non-relativistic matter in the universe today. So if you want, the, if you were to plot here the power spectrum of the total density, dark matter plus baryons, um, and in fact, even if you were to plot the dark matter only, the baryons have some, uh, the, the gravitational potential from the variants affects the dark matter, so it will look similar or the same. Um, what happens is that you, if you if, let's, let's now consider the epoch of recombination and imagining uh, solving the equations from here on for the density contrast of the total uh, matter, okay? That, as initial conditions, has the sum Oh, the density is the sum of the densities of the dark matter and, and the baryons. The dark matter is doing this uh, power law growth that I just said. However, the baryons have this acoustic oscillation. So as a function of K, the dark matter is just some simple power law, but the baryons have these wiggles. When you combine these two and solve forward, the, the final power spectrum inherits some of these wiggles from the, from the baryons that had this, this wiggle as a function of K because of but those wiggles over there, okay? These are called the baryonic acoustic oscillations, and I will have you uh, estimate the size and so on uh, in, in, in a problem. But these are, uh, we now know from the measurements of the CMB and the cosmological parameters uh, that we have already determined exactly at which scales this should appear. And so they've become a standard ruler, which you can use then to measure, use trace, you, you trace this power spectrum by measuring the clustering of galaxies. You try to find these wiggles. You know at what, uh, at what uh, K values they should occur, because we've already figured out everything about the physics of these acoustic oscillations, and the parameters are already determined from the W map. And so if we see this at a particular angle, we can figure out uh, the, these are new constraints on the late time evolution of the universe, the angular diameter distances and so on, and it becomes a constraint on, on the dark energy. And it's or the, 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 the amount of uh, the cosmological constant, you can then check also if it's indeed a cosmological constant or if there's any sort of time evolution. All of this based on something that's pretty geometrical. We know about this, we can figure out from first principles where it should be and uh, and so it's a very, nice, uh, a very nice technique in a very active area. Um, of course, the, the, um, the caveat or the complication is that we will trace these using galaxies, and so you have to worry about whether in going from the matter, we can predict beautifully what the matter should be doing, but whether when you look at this in galaxies, there's any type of... Uh, of a systematic mistake that you're making, especially because we are trying to figure out things at the percent or sub-percent level, okay? So at the 10% level, no problem, and has been done, beautiful. But if we want to go the next step, um, there might be a problem. Or we, will, we, we don't know yet where we will hit the problem. Eventually, tracing things with galaxies will lead to some systematic uh, floor but where that is, we still don't know, okay? Um, 
Um, and let, let, me, let me comment on, a, uh, on another thing as well. So, um, so let's imagine, let's, let's for a moment imagine um, a universe without dark matter. As you know, we've, you know, we believe that dark matter is there. It was introduced for, for uh, explaining first motions of uh, galaxies uh, in clusters of galaxies by Zwicky, flat rotation curves, uh, you know, a lot of uh, small scale, if you want, evidence for the existence of dark matter. But by now, we have pretty good evidence from just this linear theory kind of things also. Um, so I told you we've already determined omega matter is square very accurately from the CMB. But let's just imagine what will happen in a universe without dark matter. Just to, I just want to drive a point so that it's very clear if you, uh, you know, what, the, what the evidence is. And so apart from the, because uh, the evidence from fitting omega matter A square might be a little bit subtle. You have to run this code, see what comes out. You fit this parameter. But there are some very striking facts that if you just turn off the dark matter, okay? So let's just discuss about that. Um, first of all, one thing that you should uh, uh, think about a little bit is the fact that if during the matter era, fluctuations grow as A, okay? And if the C in the CMB, we've observed these fluctuations to be 10 to minus five. And this happens at a, matter radiation equality happens at a redshift of a few thousand. How do I get to delta of one by today? Looks like there's no time, okay? And in fact, you know, this was uh, the reason probably why people uh, looking for the fluctuations in the CMB at the, you know, after Penzias and Wilson and so, and so on, expected them to be, I don't know, 10 to minus three, not 10 to minus five. The reason why we can get to 10 to the minus, from 10 to the minus five uh, to 10 to the minus three is basically because of dark matter. Because dark matter is much more in, is the amplitude of fluctuations on, the, on smaller scales in, in, this, in the lambda CDM model, in the location of the damping tail and so on, is much larger than what we see in the CMB. The dark matter is much more inhomogeneous the, than, the bar, than the photons are at the last scattering surface. Because it has started already to grow uh, since before, and most importantly also, because it does not suffer from this silk damping, okay? So we see directly in the CMB now that on small scales, the fluctuations die exponentially just by this diffusion process, okay? So if there was no dark matter, not only we don't know how to get from 10 to the minus five to, um, to, to one, on the scales of galaxies and so on, fluctuations are exponentially, you know, there, there's this exponential damping, okay? So if you don't have dark matter and you want to explain the flat rotation curves uh, with some other story by Mond or whatever you want, some modification of gravity, then you have to decide, you have to figure out how it is that in a universe which we see at redshift of 1,000 to be homogeneous on the scales of interest because of the damping, this diffusion damping, suddenly fluctuations grow to form things much, you know, so fast in, in, uh, in time. And if the universe starts homogeneous, you know, it, you need some, some mechanism to remember that there should be a fluctuation here and th versus there, okay? So, um, so it's, it's pretty dramatic, the, 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 the effect that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that dark matter has. On small scales, there's just no fluctuations in the, in the variance at recombination, at redshift of 1,000. You need to form all the galaxies by redshift of 1,000, okay? So you better, so the easiest way is to have, uh, is to have um, some, something, the dark matter that does not suffer this silk damping and remembers and there's a potential well, and when, because the dark matter has con is continuing to grow even though we don't see it in the CMB, and when the baryons are released, they fall into the potential wells that are already there and they form the galaxies in structures that you know, are already there, okay? That's how, that's how it works in the case of, uh, of lambda CDM. Um, okay, let me see what else, uh, what else I should say. Um, 
Okay, let, 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 I, I will take uh, some, I will pass my time, I will uh, not um, follow the rules of the, of the schedule and pass a little bit uh, so that I can talk slightly about polarization because if I keep, uh, I keep um, not finishing what I want to do, I, I only have one more lecture, so anyway. So let me just pass by like, five minutes or something. So, so, um, um, so let me talk about polarization, so I'll be very fast. Um, um, we now know the CMB is linearly polarized. We've already discussed this uh, today in the lecture by... Uh, where, where does this linear polarization come from? It comes from scattering, Thomson scattering of anisotropic radiation, okay? So the CMB anisotropies themselves. If you scatter an isotropic radiation with a quadrupole, you get linear polarization. You have an electron, you have an electric, you have radiation from this side, electric field up and down moves the electron like this, it radiates this polarization into your direction, but not this one, okay? From this direction, the, the two polarizations, even if I start with unpolarized light, just from this side, in your direction, you will have only this polarization if the light only comes from here. If it comes from the top, you will have only this polarization. So in order to have in your direction a net polarization, you need more radiation from the sides than from the top. So that's a quadrupole radiation so pattern. So if you have a quadrupole radiation pattern and you have Thomson scattering, you have some linear polarization. This has been detected and you've uh, discussed some, some about it already before. So let me just tell you in the context uh, just two, two, two facts. One that might be of interest for, for you. So where is this uh, quadrupole anisotropy coming from in the case of density perturbations that we have been discussing? So imagine that you have an electron here, okay, an electron here, and this is the last scattering. Scatter comes to you, okay? So we need some sort of dependence on the intensity that is getting to this electron that is quadratic in the angle, okay? so that you get a quadrupole and you scatter. So previous uh, scattering of the light coming from this electron, say, comes from here, okay? D distance of a mean free path, okay? So now um, we need a quadratic thing in the angle. So let's start with something that already has at least one angle. So the Doppler shift. So if this, uh, let's take this guy to be at rest. If this part of the fluid is moving with a certain velocity, um, there, there will be a Doppler shift of the photons coming from here given by this, V dot N, okay? So this is linear in the angles, okay? But imagine now that the velocities have a, a spatial dependence, okay? So there's a gradient in the velocity. So actually this velocity is the velocity at the location of this electron, but plus the mean free path times n, okay, dot n. This is uh, the Doppler shift, okay? So the quadratic part in the angle is proportional to the mean free path, the gradient of the velocity, and two angles, okay? This is the source of the quadrupole, gradient of the velocity times the mean free path, okay? Because the mean free path is short, that's the reason why polarization on large scales. If the, so this is a K, the gradient is a K. So K times the mean free path suppresses the level of polarization, okay? Basically, the, 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 the quadrupole is of the size of the differences in the velocity across the mean free path. The mean free path is small. You can see uh, on the sky what angle it's obtained because it has to do with the damping tail. So more or less at the damping scale, those are modes in which this suppression is not so bad, okay? And those are where the polarization is 10 or 15% or something like that. But on larger scales, the polarization drops because of this. I, if I had picked, uh, uh, I, I wanted to have a quadrupole dependence not starting with the Doppler effect, but starting with the density, then I wouldn't have this N and I would have needed to take two derivatives, so I would have paid a bigger price, okay? So polarization is proportional to the velocity, okay? Um, or the gradient of the velocity. And if you look at plots of the polarization and the temperature power spectrum, you will see that they both have peaks. The peaks in the polarization 
are not located in the same position as the peaks in the temperature. The reason being because the temperature peaks are mainly due to the delta and phi pieces that are this cosine of uh, k, k times time, or times the sound speed. The velocity is the time derivative of this is the sine. So the modes that reach at a maximum of the density reach at a zero of the velocity. And so that's why the peaks are the, you know, the peaks of one correspond to the minimum of the other. Okay? So that's a simple thing to figure out. But so the point is that uh, polarization measures uh, things about the velocity. Okay? So, um, so this allows you to do a bunch of uh, nice things. Uh, one of them is the following. Um, you could, imagine, uh, you could imagine saying, uh, ah, okay, I'm not going to have all of this spectrum of Doppler peaks by having the, this, this delta have the structure of you know, these wiggles. Instead, this will have no structure, no scale in it, but I will put a primordial power spectrum that has wiggles on top, okay? So the, the, but this already screws up the polarization because the, if, 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 what, uh, if what has the wiggles is the initial power spectrum, those k's that have no power are the same k's in both temperature and polarization, so the peaks would be in the, the relative position of the peaks would be uh, in the wrong location, okay? And more in, so that's one thing that you can immediately say, that all of this structure is in the, is in the, in the transfer function and not in the initial power spectrum. And so, or equivalently, if you care about any kind of initial conditions that have some feature on it, it's very good to have both temperature and polarization because now you can isolate what comes from a primordial feature and what comes from the transfer function because the two transfer functions, one is the density and the other one is the velocity, okay? The second thing that you can say is, I told you, well, we now know that, um, that, uh, that uh, these perturbations come from inflation because we know that they started outside the horizon because we have a fixed phase, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I told you this. And it's true. But um, um, imagine, that you wanted to, imagine that you wanted to be um, you know, particularly bad and you wanted to see just with some sort of causal phenomena, some strings moving around, something causal, satisfied, doesn't produce anything outside the horizon. Can I still get a structure of peaks? I told you probably not, and in practice when you do calculation for uh, you know, using inputs for how these strings move in specific cases, what I, what I told you was true. Uh, and the reason being that if you have these random things that move, they will generate uh, density wave with both faces because inside the horizon both faces are equally nice and so you will not, not get uh, the structure of peaks. However, imagine you want to do, imagine uh, you did the following. You have some source of uh, creation of perturbation such that it's active only at the, horizon at, the ho at the horizon scale at every given time and very quickly uh, dies, okay? In that case, you excite the mode right around horizon crossing by this random thing, but you do it a little bit inside the horizon, so you are respecting causality. You're not trying to excite something outside the horizon, but you do it here, and then you let it go. And you do it always in the same way. When the mode crosses the horizon, you give it a kick. Then, because you're not touching it anymore, you will, you will recover this structure of peaks, okay? Um, so you can, violating, doing things just inside the horizon, create these peaks. But immediately, if you look at polarization, you see that this is ruled out as well because of the following. Imagine maybe, maybe it's easier to think about it in real space. Imagine that in the case of inflation, there's a region with some initial perturbation, okay? What will happen? Some overdense region, there's more of this plasma, more pressure, it will, there will be some sound wave moving out. As, as, as this uh, size of this thing becomes comparable to the horizon, the gas will notice that it's here more dense than there. There will be some sort of wave going out, which is this, ways that we've been talking about. Imagine you wanted to do the same thing inside the, without putting it from the initial conditions, but you, you wanted to do it inside the horizon. Okay, what you would need to do? You would start with a flat universe with no perturbation. Very quickly, as when this scale becomes of the size of the horizon, you rush matter in, okay, create a little perturbation and let it go. Then the sound wave that comes out after you've put it there and let it go is more or less the same as the one before. 
and you will then get this structure of peaks, okay? But there's a very clear difference. In one case, you start the situation with the overdensity here, so there's an overdensity and the stuff is flowing in as initial conditions. However, in the other case, you, it, it needs to start with the velocities coming in. You are putting it there, so you're bringing the velocities towards the overdensities instead, instead of the velocities starting outside, away from the overdensities, okay? So, because the polarization measures velocities, this cross-correlation of temperature and polarization that you were shown this morning basically it just measures the relative sign between overdensities and velocities. At the initial conditions, where the velocities started going out from the overdensity or started going in. And we've measured the sign of started going out, okay? So we know that there's no mechanism, it's it just, now it's a theorem. We cannot have anything even crazy, just assembling things and letting them go in order to create these peaks, okay? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty, tight argument that uh, what we see was there from the initial, from the initial conditions. And, uh, and I will not talk about E and B, maybe I'll mention that uh, next class. Okay, let me stop there.